Hello everybody, my name is Thorsten Hoffler. I am a professor at ETH Zurich and I now present the a keynote talk I gave at the AI for Developers workshop at Supercomputing uh, 23, which you can also find in the, in the Supercomputing archive, but I think this is uh, better to have an open version here and I was also requested to record it because apparently it, it vanished <laughs> at, the, at the end of the year from the Supercomputing archive. So this talk is actually a combination of many other talks I gave uh, previously put into a a consistent story of how to do, how to perform artificial intelligence driven performance metaprogramming. So you may have seen uh, parts of that talk before, but bear with me, it's going to be an interesting um, combination of many aspects of the work that uh, uh, my team and, and myself have done before in a different, from a different perspective, from the different, uh, from the perspective of AI uh, driven metaprogramming. But first, why do we uh, care about AI at a high-performance computing conference like supercomputing? Well, I mean, high-performance computing is really massively changing right now. It is massively changing because of everything is massively changing because of these new um, large language models such as uh, ChatGPT or, or the foundation model behind the GPT-4 because it can actually be <laughs> your, your lawyer. It, uh, it, it could be your business administrator. It could be your doctor. In fact, if it was your doctor, you would probably prefer it as your doctor because it's very empathetic. Um, it could also be us. It could be a performance engineer. It could be a programmer. And this is something that is quite uh, interesting for the community to figure out whether it will actually replace us. Um, also, many companies Many private companies are building supercomputers. And for us at the supercomputing conference, that is a super interesting um, development. Facebook, a social media platform, builds a supercomputer. Google, a, a company uh, living off uh, advertisement revenues from arranging knowledge or from uh, showing knowledge, sharing knowledge, builds a supercomputer. Microsoft, a <laughs> company known for its Office products and, and Azure services, builds supercomputers for high performance artificial intelligence. And even has comics on it. And even the car company, Tesla, <laughs> cars, they are run by supercomputer technology. So it's incredibly important for us to understand what's going on and how to use the same technology for our benefit here. So what does this mean? Well, how, how do these large language models work? It's, it's actually quite simple. So they train foundation models in a way that you take a lot of text off the internet, like this one, you remove some words, you run it through a, a, a function that is represented by a, a decoder network or the transformer architecture, which is an encoder and a decoder, but usually in generative models, you, you only care about the decoder, which is literally a function that has millions, if not billions, in the case of GPT uh, networks, it's, it's many hundreds of billions uh, parameters that then are learned based on the actual knowledge of what I removed. So the model makes a proposal, like you can see here, a probability distribution of what is the most likely word, so not as is at the very top, but then you of course know which word you removed. So you, you take the so-called golden, uh, golden copy or golden truth, and then you update your weights, these billions of weights, layer, white and the back layer wise and the back propagation step to learn a better version of the function. You do this millions of times, and eventually you will have a model that is able to predict the statistical distribution of text in the internet. Since text in the internet is basically all of human knowledge that we have fed into the internet, this model is quite capable because it knows how to reconstruct all of human knowledge. Like the talk I'm giving right now, most likely we'll be going through dozens of language models and the language model is learning the statistical distribution of the words I'm using and the language model is going to learn from what I'm saying right now, like you are learning from what I'm saying right now. I'm not saying you're a language model, maybe I'm a language model, but <laughs> that's up for, for debate. But this really means this is a, a revolution going on that, that we still don't understand the full um, the, the full scope of it. So people say it's a more than a trillion dollar industry uh, that is going to be launched or market is going to be launched by this development. So it really means for us at the supercomputing conference that deep learning drives our future computer architectures. That, that's already a fact. So we have to adopt to it. So what does it mean for these future computer architectures to be driven by deep learning workloads? Well, mainly three different things. We will need to deal with small data types because most of these accelerators will support very small data types because these models can work really well with low precision data types like FP, uh, FP8 or even smaller um, FP4, INT4 for inference purposes are working at these models. In high performance computing, it is a struggle to even employ FP32 in many examples. Furthermore, matrix and vector operations. These language models are dominated 
largely dominate, more than 95% in many models, by matrix multiplications of these small uh, data types. So this is something you can accelerate quite a bit with NVIDIA Tensor Cores, for example, or vector operations in CUDA cores. Other vendors are, of course, putting up the same uh, technology. NVIDIA was just uh, at the large market first. And the last piece that's very important is structured sparsity. So also NVIDIA has a two to four structured sparsity available that is very machine learning specific and we have to figure out how to do it on uh, scientific computing workloads or we just don't use the capacity provided to us by these vendor provided machines, by these supercomputers that we will have everywhere. Every NVIDIA accelerated super supercomputer has the structured sparsity. Most are not using it. It's just sitting there unused. So now we have this multi-billion hardware industry, billion dollar hardware industry driven by various companies and various large companies and a very large number of startups. So this is actually kind of a gold rush going on since a while, trying to enter this market with your new ideas, how to build more and more specialized hardware devices and really go after the big business, the trillion dollar business. This is more than most countries' GDP. So it's an, it's an amazing business opportunity many see here. But this is not what I want to discuss in this talk. I want to ask the question, can AI help us to tune our codes to this new environment? So can AI help us to use AI hardware for scientific computing? And well, the answer is of course easy because AI can do anything. Didn't I just say that? AI uh, or large language models in many ways have all of the knowledge of humanity that's on the internet internalized and of course they can help us. The question is, how can they help us? Well, how do they internalize this knowledge? It's by embedding it in a high dimensional space. This is where these matrix multiplications come in. So with the right embedding, we can actually use these ideas of uh, artificial intelligence for our benefit to drive the tuning of codes. So this is what I want to explain and motivate today that we should be worrying about embeddings for codes in various ways. So what does it mean? Well, code can be represented in any manner of representation. So from an AI perspective, we can just look at source code. This is what we humans usually look at when we write our code, we look at source code. Uh, we all know this, nothing special about it. The source code is then compiled into an abstract syntax tree, which you can also linearize again in a textual form. It's slightly different than the source code itself. It's usually not uh, it's usually not very well human readable, but humans can, of course, read it. <laughs> and then it's very often compiled into an internal form, that static single assignment, where every variable is only assigned once. So if you want to overwrite a variable, you have to create a new name for that variable, which makes it easier for machines to reason about data flow, also for humans, to reason about data flow property. And at the very end, it's compiled to assembly, which is very close to machine code. So assembly and machine code, I would say, are basically equivalent. But you see there are now four different forms of these, um, of these languages. And to just add to this, assembly is just a, a human readable form of, of a binary encoded machine code. So we have these four different forms. And the first question for an AI model, of, for applying an AI model would be, where do we attack? Right? Which of those four representations do we choose? And of course, we weren't in artificial intelligence if not everything would have been tried. And here, even this, these references are outdated. There are many, many more examples of using, for example, the source code, using abstract syntax trees, using stat static uh, single assignment, or actually also working on the assembly level of code. So we are uh, specifically going a little bit into the, the uh, static single assignment form. We'll see, we'll, we'll see how that goes. In fact, we'll be using m multiple elements of internal representation of compilers um, for our uh, own uh, AI-based embedding of those. So, but the first question is, why don't we just look at the source code like we humans do? Because after all, these very large language models, they have, they work on, on, on human readable formats. They, they work really like humans to represent statistical distributions of human language. And so there's an interesting argument to be made here that this is a very good idea, but I want to make an argument that this may not be the best idea if we care about semantics. However, I'm split on this, so we can argue this uh, over a coffee at some point, whether human readable format is a good idea or uh, we should go deeper to really understand the requirements uh, of the semantics of the language. So now a task for you is classify what, what functionality this function that we've written down here in a C-like syntax um, actually implements. So if I ask a biological brain, uh, you will be able to say this in about 10 seconds. So let me just look at it and 
yeah, I, I, guess, I guess you have it. So it's pretty clear that it's a factorial. In fact, the language, oh, sorry, the, the uh, embedding model would have concluded exactly the same thing with a 50% uh, probability, but still the highest one would be returning the factorial. So now we have, a, 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 we just change one variable name, change n to x in this model. So what happens here? Well, if we actually language model on this, we would be getting um, a completely different function classification, though. So we would be getting a sinus function, <laughs> or sin c, a, as, a, as a classification. So that's not great. And actually, if we change it to this, if we call this factorial, it would have made your job easier as a human, of course, but it also makes the language model's job easier. So somehow the language model uses semantic, uh, sorry, syntactic elements instead of semantic elements. So it gets confused by the variable x, but it gets uh, really benefited by the reasonable naming of the function, which is also true for us humans, even though I would claim most humans wouldn't get confused by a variable renaming. But what we see in this example is that syntactic elements, naming of things, influence the accuracy of the model. Is this something we want? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. In this case, I would say that semantics, for this talk here, I would say semantics should solely depend on the operation and not on the naming, because after all, all of these three functions implement exactly the same functionality. They should all be factorial, independent of how I name my variables. But here we can argue about what's human friendly and what is not. So this is why uh, the first work that, that my, my group, led by Tal Ben Nun, um, implemented or, or, or tried was neural code comprehension, also called ins to vec where we look at the instructions in an internal representation of the LLVM internal representation, and we build a model based on this. The benefit of this is, of course, that the LLVM compiler has many, many, many frontends, so we can compile many languages into this internal representation, and this internal representation is, of course, standardized, and then we uh, derive uh, our data flow block based on, uh, sorry, our data flow graph based on representations of basic blocks, and we then build a contextual flow graph from it. And on this contextual flow graph, we learn on uh, pairs of uh, dependent or, or distanced, uh, pairs at a certain distance of a context for uh, a certain instruction. So I'll go into detail in that in a minute. So what we used is basically a skip gram model. That was a paper from 2018. Uh, with the knowledge we had today, we would most likely not be using a skip gram model plus RNNs. We would most likely be using transformers for this. Um, but at the time, we just, represented each statement somehow as an embedding vector. The embedding represents uh, the semantics of the statement in this context. So we try to understand the semantics from the statement within a certain context. What is a, a context? The, the context is basically um, all operations that are in a certain distance, in a certain neighborhood distance from uh, or a certain path length in this graph, in this contextual flow graph, from uh, the, uh, the operation at, uh, that, that we're looking at. Here, for example, if you look at, at FCMP, we can see that at distance two, we have an F model instruction that would be uh, parts of the context. So then we use a, a standard skip gram model with a, a fixed embedding in the middle and a, a very large vocabulary size for all of these uh, instru uh, possible instructions. We feed them all in as a one hot encoded vector. We uh, train the embedding. I mean, it's, it's of course a skip gram model, so we have these two ends that we are training in the embedding. We take the first half of the model, um, get to the embedding. We run the embedding through um, multiple LSTM units. And again, today we would most likely be using a transformer for this. And then um, we output or we, we fine tune this to various tasks like malicious code detection, guided programming, code optimization, and hardware mapping. So just to show you some results, and this is really this is really it. We just trained the model. The setup you can find in the paper down there. Actually, there's also a talk, a full talk on this paper on our YouTube channel that you can find um, given by uh, Shoshana Jakubovic, and um, she'll explain all the, the, the nasty, gory details of how this was done. But for the high level, we'll just stick to this here. Um, so we actually find that the algorithm classification accuracy on a data set is significantly higher than previous works. Um, it's quite nice. We also predict which device is faster for device mapping CPU or GPU better than uh, existing um, techniques. We also find optimal tiling sizes much faster, so based on a predictive model, uh, not much faster, but <laughs> more accurate than existing techniques. So this is all done with a context size of two, and you could also look at the T's knee plot, and there's more details in the actual paper, that you actually see that similar contexts in different uh, programs are mapped to similar um, spaces in this uh, 2D visualization of a high-dimensional space. So that is quite nice. 
and um, so we even get this interesting analogy score that between similar it's automatically learning that instructions that are somewhat similar in the IR so like an, an add and a um, no, what, what would be a good example? An add of a constant and an add of a variable, um, they're actually close to each other in this embedding space. So, so this was quite interesting that this was automatically learned in the model. So, well, could we just say we are done? Well, actually, there's a problem with these XG, XFGs as we found later. So these XFGs, they have no notion of order. So, and, and it's just a context, right? It's all, all just pairs without an order. It's just a set of pairs. And now let me look at this example and let us together look at this example. So we now have, a, a, again, an LVM IR, a very small example, an FDIF of a float number. So if you don't have an order here, it could be um, variable 3 is 0 divided by variable 1, or it could be variable 1 divided by 0, which is, of course, an exception. So it's a very, very different outcome dividing by a constant, or if you, if you have a division involving a constant that is 0. Uh, even any other concept would be a very different outcomes. So somehow the order matters a whole lot. So what did we do? We teamed up uh, with uh, Chris Cummins uh, from Edinburgh at the time and, and his advisor Hugh Leather. Uh, they are now both at Facebook and are continuing this work, in fact, and uh, came up with a, a slightly better representation that lifts the contextual flow graph to a full um, to a full data flow graph, as I'll explain in a minute. So we basically uh, compile the same code into the LVMIR again. Then we build a flow graph, as I just mentioned. We add variables and data to this flow graph such that we actually have all the representations of all the input data constants and whatnot and the input variables. And we also add a function call structure to this graph. And then instead of training a skip gram model, we are using a graph neural network, which by the time uh, be between 2018 and 2021 gained much more popularity. And this graph neural network, in fact, uh, was able to learn much better what the neighborhood relationships and what these uh, semantics of the graph were. So there was a new thing, in case you're not familiar with graph neural networks, these are networks that work on arbitrary graph structures. So you could imagine it's a CNN in some sense. A CNN is a, a convolutional neural network, works on a fixed uh, a graph structure, usually a Cartesian graph in some sense with Cartesian neighborhoods, but, but there are different tweaks of CNNs, of course. A graph neural network does a neighborhood, um, a neighborhood accumulation just on an arbitrary graph structure. So you have input features that you read from your neighbors and you merge with a predefined kind of stencil-like um, operation, a learned operation into your current vertex and you do this for multiple layers. The number of layers is then the distance in the graph that every vertex, uh, every vertex's receptive field um, somewhat in CNN terminology covers. So you train this GNN model and you can run inferences very, very similar to, to normal models. And then you have typical classification and regression tasks. So there's no big difference. It's literally just the structure you run on, which is a, a graph structure in this case. If you want to learn more about this, by the way, graph neural networks are very high, um, high in coming right now. Um, if you want to learn how to under, uh, if you want to understand how to run them on a parallel and distributed network, we have a wonderful survey and also a tutorial online on our YouTube channel that uh, Maciej Vesta and, and uh, myself teach to really get people started with graph neural networks because they are quite important. So back to Programmable. Programmable is the graph neural network for um, uh, program analysis with machine learning, as the name suggests. And as you can see here, if you look at standard compiler task, reachability, dominator tree, data dependency, lifeness, sub-expression, um, uh, analysis, global common sub-expression analysis, for example, and you can see that we achieve extremely high precision and recall across the whole set of tasks. So this is quite nice. While we, of course, know that each of those um, analyses are quite simple to do with algorithms themselves, like a dominator tree algorithm, say we'll get a 100% uh, precision, or even here we get a 100% as well. <laughs> um, it's quite fascinating to see that a completely learned a GNN can do this by itself from, from just data examples. So, and, and a pretty high accuracy, not 100%, but pretty high accuracy. So now I conclude that we have these embeddings. What do we now do with these embeddings? Well, let's go into a little bit of a case study with a real code, with a real climate code. So how do these climate codes uh, work today? Most of those are written in Fortran and many of those need to run on GPUs because GPUs are the devices that high-performance computing makes available to climate scientists. So as I mentioned before, many are used in the AI context, but high-performance computing uh, people must adopt to, to the moving field. So what they do is they take the original Fortran code here all in black and they annotate um, this Fortran code with OpenACC uh, or OpenMP 
5.0 uh, pragmas that somehow describe to the compiler that, for example, this loop there is independent or multiple of these loops are independent and can be parallelized. Um, the problem with this approach is, of course, that, well, if you look at the ISO 9126 norm, is that the analyzability and the uh, changeability suffers from duplication of the code. So it's not great, and you can, you can read this up in this paper cited up there. So if I duplicate code, I will have a hard time later analyzing the code and actually change the code. And it's very simple to understand. If I write in this loop, ACC loop independent, and later I can change a single character in this loop and it's not independent anymore, I will have a bug if I do not remove the ACC loop independent. And this is one thing that is extremely important to understand. But it's really not a good idea to annotate uh, additional properties in loop nests or, or an, an anything in the code that is depending on the semantics of the code. So it would be much better to derive these properties when you compile the code from the semantics of the code instead of annotating them separately. Because as you change the code later, these properties may change and you will not rederive them. You will just accept your annotations and get really, really hard to debug problems with your code. Okay, so here duplication is generally not a great thing for software engineers. Um, and actually, if you look at this example, uh, the, this is an example I don't want to mention, out of the 6,400 source, source lines of code in Fortran code, 800, so 13% are duplicates in some sense, semantic duplicates. They annotate what these variables mean, and this is what the compiler or a, a model should be able to derive from those. So somehow this is quite sad. And, and even for the extremely important application icon here, this is still about 1% OpenMP and 3% OpenACC annotations that are leading to the code duplication I talked about earlier. So now, how do we fix this? Well, one way to fix it is to actually enable the compiler to reason about the properties of the code without these annotations. And one way we are pushing in my group and Scalable Parallel Computing Lab at ETH Zurich is the, the DACE framework where we have the domain scientists write code in some higher level language, for example, Fortran itself, or also DSLs, NumPy, and, and PyTorch. And this language is then compiled by an applied scientist into an internal representation, which then a performance engineer, so a code ninja in some sense, works on. Because in this internal representation, the, all the dependencies are visible to the performance engineer. And then at the end, we just emit code to CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. So it's quite complex, the code backends. Um, however, at, at the high level, they're quite easy to understand because they just translate this internal representation into another representation. You could see this as opening up the compiler. So in some sense, we are developing a compiler that enables a performance engineer to add additional functionality to change the internal representation, which you can do in LVM, for example, with passes. But writing um, program-specific passes is a hard task, so we try to make this as easy as possible, and this is what we call performance metaprogramming. So literally, we, we allow the programmer, we encourage the performance engineer to do open heart surgery on the code, rewriting the code, performance metaprogramming, for performance reasons. So the performance engineer writes little programs, we call those transformations, that transform the code from one representation into another ideally faster one that is semantically equivalent. So at the end, the DSL allows high productivity, tens of lines of source code. It's DSL is only, in our examples here, aimed at productivity. Then the performance engineer cares about the performance. So DSLs make it convenient. Performance engineering, performance metaprogramming makes it fast. And then at the end, we generate auto-generate code. So to make it convenient, we can only have tens of lines of code for the uh, scientists to write. The performance engineer we, can be a little bit less convenient, well, hundreds of lines of code, um, but reusable for different applications. So we have a library of optimizations. And at the end, what's generated for the CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs, ah, nobody really uh, cares about the complexity of that code. Um, so, so that's OK. So just to give you an example, um, under the lead of the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, at the time uh, led by Uli Foro and, and my, uh, my postdoc at the time, Tal Ben Noon, we looked at um, the PACE program, uh, project uh, in the context of performance metaprogramming. So PACE was really rewriting the FV3 uh, climate and weather application, so an atmospheric model, um, in Python, fully in Python, so the dynamic core to be uh, more precise. So this was an uh, extremely ambitious project and they wanted to get rid of all the Fortran code. So really move the whole code to 
Neo's programming with DevOps package management and I don't know, um, all kinds of interesting things. So the Dynamical Core is 12,000 lines of Python and um, the uh, original version was uh, 30,000 lines, so significantly smaller. I don't want to go into too much detail here. They're using the GT4 Pi language developed at the Swiss National Supercomputing Center that itself has a backend going into our uh, day's data-centric uh, environment. And again, the software architecture is not important here. By the way, if you're interested in more details of in this Pace uh, for Days project, um, you can find a talk by Tal ben Nguyen on our YouTube channel, uh, uh, SPCL's YouTube channel where you're watching this video right now. So this uh, performance metaprogramming, how does it work? Well, we translated this into an internal representation, which you can now see on the left. Unfortunately, the, um, the contrast is not uh, very high, but now we can zoom in and we can look at more loop nests. And unfortunately, if you look at this code with 12,000 lines of code, there will be thousands of loop nests in this code. And each of those will have a whole lot of little code in them, so it's quite hard to understand and you can easily get frustrated as a performance engineer if you would really need to look at all of those manually write transformations and, uh, and optimize it this way. So what we now looked at is that the performance engineer gives us initial heuristics. The performance engineer tells us how to deal with certain loop nests, certain example loop nests, and then what we want to do is we want to automatically apply those using AI techniques to the overall application. So one thing we can do now is we can look at specific parts of the uh, data flow graph of what we call the SDFG. So this is what we call graph cutouts. And then we have certain patterns that the performance engineer gave us how to optimize those. So if you have a certain loop nest, we have possible transformations to be applied to that loop nest. All of these transformations will be semantically equivalent. So they will not change any of the code. So there's no correctness problem. When we pick a transformation, we know that it's correct. All we do here is we try to, in, in the remainder of the talk, is we try to understand which optimizations are the good ones without running a fully um, exhaustive search through all of the possible optimizations. And again, all optimizations that we, all transformations for each of the, of the loop nests are semantically equivalent. This is what the, the, the day's language uh, guarantees. So, but now the problem would be if we run this on, on, uh, on the PACE program in, in days, we would get about 30 million possible uh, combinations of transformations, right? Because it's an exponential space, because each of those apply independently, and now we need to look at all these combinations. So quite complicated. But with the technique uh, based on performance embedding and transfer tuning, we get this down to 600. And these 600 we can just measure. This runs in a couple of hours, in fact, uh, two hours and 42 minutes on our particular machine to test all of those. For the overall graph, we are running um, eight hours, uh, a little bit more than eight hours total. So this is the, um, the, the high-level idea of transfer tuning. But now let me go a little bit more into detail. Um, how does transfer tuning work in detail? So or basically how to take these GNN code embeddings and combine them with performance measurement. Because what I explained before is how we get these GNN code embeddings. But now what we need is we need performance as well on the game, which we didn't have before. I, all these things we, we did before were really not closely linked to performance. Okay, so now we have these loop nests. These loop nests are extracted from the optimization backend, as I mentioned, or the loop nest and cutout is, is kind of the same uh, thing here. So we have variable, uh, various loop nests in, in, a, in the, the space of all potential loop nests. We store those in a database and we store those as, as uh, keys that identify loop nest and potential optimizations. And now the question is, if we now look at a different application, how do we get to, um, how do we identify the right loop nests? And what we do, is we group those loop nests now by similar performance bottlenecks. So we query the loop nest by similarity, but automatically it will generate a clustering that the, uh, that the in, in, in a certain space, in the embedding space, and this is what we are hoping, that this is automatically learned, and we will demonstrate this in a, in a couple of minutes, that these loop nests that have similar bottlenecks are clustered together. Like so, yeah, these, these two yellow ones, they may have a memory problem and, and these, uh, these guys down here, they, they may have a, a schedule problem and these guys down here may have a cache problem or w w whatever. I mean, this, this is what we don't prescribe what these problems are. We just hope to learn an embedding space where vectors are close together uh, if they have uh, particular similar properties. And then what we do is we, we look at a particular program and we match 
in this embedding space that we trained. Right? So we do a, a k-nearest neighbor search. Um, so just to look a little bit more at, uh, at, at detail here, so we have a loop nest on the left side here, a three-dimensional loop nest. And what we do is we encode in the embedding um, all kinds of properties of the loop nest, like the structure, the memory accesses, the memory bandwidth, and the and, and cache misses. But actually, the vector embedding is a little bit more complicated because now there are structural properties of the loop. These structural properties come from, come from DACE, so we have the stateful data flow graph, so it compiles the loop into a data flow graph. Now, what we do is we, we train a graph neural network on the static features of the structure of the program, right? And then the question is, well, what do we do with the inputs now? Because we need to run the program in order to understand memory accesses and memory bandwidth and cache misses. So that is a completely different uh, path here in some sense. So we now run this, uh, this loop nest with a representative input, which we just gather from an actual real application run. And then we look at dynamic features such as performance counters, many, many different performance counters. And now we encode those performance counters with the representative inputs as a multi-layer perceptron, the structure of the code with the graph neural network. We concatenate the two, and then we get our vector key, our embedding. Right? So, so it's, it's two components. The, the one I discussed before, the, the graph embedding, um, and now the new thing is that we get these performance counters in as an MLP. It's a very, very simple MLP. And what we do then is we build a database out of many, many, many loop nests and known optimizations for these loop nests, um, known best optimizations for each of these loop nests. So we run an exhaustive search to build this database. And this is quite nice because now we have, we, we can find, based on the structure of the loop nest, we can find other loop nests that we have tuned before with similar performance properties. So for example, sustained uh, memory bandwidth or data locality and things like this. So now we can, of course, we have to evaluate it somehow. We tested it with NumPy Bench and, and many other codes. And now let's actually evaluate how these loop nests or how this embedding performs. So what we now do is we try to, oh no, no we try to, we, <laughs> We um, use various models such as reuse distance, which is a very simple model that should be able to predict main memory bandwidth or data locality, because that's what it's designed for. Um, we use our embedding IR2, uh, no, sorry, we, we, we use another embedding IR2VEC. We use a tiramisu compilers embedding and our model. So, and if you look at it, this is the mean variation of, mem uh, of neighbors for different performance metrics. So main memory bandwidth and data locality, and of course, if these are clustered together, the variation should be as little as possible for the main memory bandwidth because our embedding space is only good if the, uh, the, the, the embeddings for the loop nest have similar performance properties. So the lower, the better. We see that reuse distance is doing an okay job, but even the simple models that we have here, although the different models, they're not necessarily simple, do an okay job, but our model outperforms all of those because we tune both the observed performance counters as well as the, um, the structural properties of the loop. So this is, this is quite nice. So we, with this, we basically show that our performance embeddings make sense for these simple metrics such as main memory bandwidth and data locality. By the way, when I say simple metrics, I'm kind of simple to explain metrics, but extremely hard to model metrics, by the way. So now we have our embedding space, so we can now look at this matching. How do we do this matching? Well, as I explained before, we have a known optimization. So this is what we've seen in our, in our set to build the database. So for example, we have this loop. We, had a, we, we know, uh, days knows that this loop is fully parallel, so we can run OpenMP parallel four. So a potential transformation was this parallelize it. And now let's say we have this loop nest down here, which days also tells us, well, this is fully parallel. We could drop OpenMP parallel fours, but now the question is, where should we drop those parallel fours? And again, the analysis for correctness is here independent of the search for the best optimization, right? So it would not give us the, or this would not give us the option to make this loop parallel if it was not, if, if there was a dependency in it, if it was not parallel. So just, just for you to understand. Um, so, but now this similarity search is working on these embedding vectors for the loop. So here we have the loop i embedding vector, it gets us this embedding. And now we embed all of those statements here, this, uh, this B, this loop I, this loop J, and this A statement. And now it lo we are looking using the Hungarian method um, for the closest loop nest here. And we see that, that this, the second one looks pretty close to this one in this animation here. And we see the I loop corresponds to this I loop because they're actually exactly the same in our embedding. So great, wonderful. So we now found these closed loops. We now know that we want to parallelize this loop. And this is literally how it works. And 
So we compare now the auto scheduler um, by Baghdadi et al, um, which is a Monte Carlo tree search. So it actually searches through multiple combinations with our loop nest based method where we are looking only at a constant number of neighbors. So we are much, much, much cheaper. And um, we, but we use our performance embedding database here, right? So we have these ref this reference database that was tuned before. So this is our trick in some sense. Um, and then we, as I just said, we, we have a constant number of queries. So here this MCTS tree search runs a lot of different compilation experiments. So they're quite expensive and, and measures those. And we just carry an, a fixed number of these neighbors. So here actually we see various numbers of uh, various benchmarks from the NumPy bench um, benchmark suite. I can highly recommend you looking at the NumPy bench benchmark suite if you're optimizing NumPy codes. Um, this is the number of explored states with the MCTS method that we showed before. That is uh, by Baghdadi et al. We can see the achieved performance by that method. And then we have for two different number of neighbors, so either five or 10 in our approximate nearest, nearest neighbor search, uh, we have the performance results relative to the MCTS tuned version. And we can see that in many cases, we largely outperform that version. In, in one case, we are significantly worse because our uh, embedding space does not well represent this Dvorshi's wavelet. Um, we, we're uh, debugging why, um, but in many cases, we are actually significantly better. And this all at a constant compilation overhead. And this is extremely expensive to run these 140,000 different versions of the code, for example. Okay, so now the question is, well, it's great that this works in NumPy bench, but can we actually do this on a real application on this real climate code? And yes, this is really important to run these climate codes because the earth is getting warmer on average. Here in Switzerland, we are, uh, we are having now the second um, holiday season without much snow, which is quite annoying because uh, when I was younger, there was much more snow. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, we are warming up. Um, so now looking at these evaluated uh, systems, where did we run this at? At the Pittstein supercomputer at the Swiss National Supercomputing Center. Uh, we also ran it on the Joules Booster. In this talk, we will not uh, have enough time to talk about the Joules Booster. If you really care about these results, I would highly recommend watching uh, either re reading the paper that was published at SC22 or watching Tal's talk that is also on our uh, YouTube channel, at the SPCL channel. So we have a, a, st a standard domain size of 192 by 192 by 80. Um, so now the first observation is that the CPU on this machine has 43 gigabyte per second uh, memory bandwidth. The GPU on this machine has 500 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth. So we see a potential speed up if we assume the code is memory bandwidth bound in the roof line level on, on, the, uh, on the, the, the vertical and on the roof line. Um, then we get a potential speed up of, of about 11.5x. Um, so if you look at some solvers, so for example, the vertical solver, this code has many, many, many stencils. So hundreds of stencils. I'm just going to discuss uh, two or maybe three in the following couple of minutes. So if you look at the Fortran code with varying domain sizes, so here we have um, varying domain size and here we, we, for convenience, we plot the relative size. You can see the runtime goes up and you can see the scaling. So for one X, so 2.28, four, uh, four X goes to 4.7, nine X goes to 9.9. So this is quite nice. So um, the, the scaling gets slightly worse, like the number gets slightly higher because the CPU cache is running out as we are going larger, right? The tiling is not optimal. Small ones run fully in CPU cache, larger ones don't. If we now look at the um, GPU case, it's actually even more interesting because we are running, uh, we, we, we don't have enough parallelism to keep the whole GPU busy, unfortunately, in this implementation, but we still get a significant speed up of about 8x for this kernel, so over the CPU, which is, which is quite nice. Um, so now for a different kernel where Fortran runs a single slice of a, of a three-dimensional domain, we can actually see um, that for very small domains here, only 0.13% of loads are, are misses. And then for the 9x bigger domain, unfortunately, it's running 30 times slower because we have more cache misses. So we are again going to have the problem running out of cache on the CPU. while. Um, while the, uh, the, the GPU implementation here in this case gives us an 8x speed up over the CPU, so not quite the 11.4x we wanted to see, but still um, much more because we are closing in on the CPU and the bandwidth factor. By the way, much of the performance of the CPU here comes from good tiling and good cache locality, which on the GPU is much harder to achieve. So if you now look at weak scaling of this code, running from uh, 54 to the full system size, essentially, uh, nearly the full system size, 2,400 GPUs, we can see that the, the Fortran version of the original code versus the, the DACE optimized version 
Um, the overall code performance is about three point, uh, somewhere between 3.4 and 3.9 times faster than the Fortran code at very large scale, like essentially thousands of GPUs in this example. And we actually achieve a nice result of 0.12 uh, simulated years per day at 2.6 kilometer grid scale, grid spacing on this relatively old machine. So this was six weeks of work, um, 10 optimization revisions, so not too many actually, four performance engineers only. Um, we achieved this speed up, uh, if you look at the kernels, up to 8.48x. There were zero model changes, like the, the, the domain scientists has not seen any change, which is quite nice. Um, and again, you can watch this, uh, the full talk of this particular result on our YouTube channel. So it's great. But do we really want to rewrite all the codes? Do you really want to take your Fortran code with a million lines of code and rewrite it? Couldn't AI help us to deal with existing codes? Well, if you actually take a second look at Fortran, um, we have these DSLs for um, um, productivity and portability, but really they are trying to be a nicer front end, a more productive front end, to a uh, more flexible front end to libraries like Blast, Limpack, and Laypack. And if you go back to the actual the, the core of this, you will find that many scientific problems are really manipulation of arrays with scientific formulas, which Fortran was designed for. So Fortran is actually quite a, a nice language, which is even coming back in 2021. It, it re-enters the top 20 programming languages on the list. In 2023, it's actually still rising on a, uh, with a positive gradient going forward. Great. Well, eventually, I'm, I would still uh, claim doubts about the future and the ecosystem and the productivity of Fortran. But if we are pragmatic, we have millions of lines of code written in Fortran, for example, this Cloud SC application by ECMWF. This application has been rewritten in C and also in, in C++ and CUDA, but the original version is a lot of Fortran codes. And this Fortran code is what the scientists tend to write. If you look at this Fortran code, and it's actually very high performance on a CPU. If you run it sequentially on a CPU and this AMD Epic, and you run compared to the C code, manually rewritten and tuned, the C code is significantly slower. So it's about 30, 40% slower in this case. So this is not so great. I mean, this is really, in some sense, sad for, the, for C code, but it's easy to understand because C code is much harder to analyze from a, a for a computer because it has all these pointers and uh, potential aliasing issues. So now what we want to, uh, what, what we experimented with is we tried to take the unchanged Fortran code and apply performance metaprogramming to it. So the idea was we compile Fortran to the day's intermediate representation, then do performance metaprogramming now specifically for climate codes like we did before in the um, DSL-based version, and we achieve performance very similar to uh, the Fortran code. In fact, this is an old result. Just two weeks ago, we submitted a newer paper where we are about 15% faster than the uh, tuned Fortran code. So this is quite nice. Um, when you parallelize this automatically with our performance metaprogramming, you get a 20x speed up, even slightly faster than the manually optimized Fortran code and much faster than the manually optimized C plus OpenMP code. Now, if you can also run this on GPUs, you get 100 times faster, which is slightly, um, which is about the same speed as the Fortran plus OpenACC code and slightly slower than the ma handle, uh, manually tuned CUDA code. Actually, with the latest result I was mentioning earlier of two weeks ago, we are at exactly the same speed or even slightly faster, but that may be in the noise of the C plus CUDA code. So quite nice. We can do this all automatically. So now we have talked about this, uh, and this was all based, uh, by the way, on performance uh, AI methods, so, so the loop similarity search with a new technique we call loop normalization, which is, is extremely powerful. And, and watch for the paper and the talk coming uh, forward here. So now the question is really, can AI help us to tune our code? The answer is, of course, yes. We looked at one particular way to do it. We looked at the way to use performance embeddings based on internal representations of the code. So we specifically used graph neural networks to do this. Um, we then showed how transfer tuning can create embeddings that combine structural properties uh, captured by the graph neural network with performance properties such as uh, um, uh, measured uh, performance counters using an MLP together into a uh, representation that allows us to tune, to basically automatically tune uh, performance metaprogrammed codes. So if you like these kinds of things, we're always looking for PhD students, postdocs, and academic visitors. So if you're employed at some other institution in Zurich, so you could look at this web page, uh, SPCL Jobs. We are now just recently moved to a wonderful new building on the 17th floor with a wonderful view over Zurich. So with that, thank you very much.